Welcome to the Assurology Show, a growth hacker's guide to human capital management with your host, Mike Vinoy. Each week, we bring you experts in human resources, employment law, accounting, benefits planning, and more to build productive organizations. You'll gain practical guidance for your business. You'll be alerted to the latest news and mega trends that impact small and mid-sized companies. We'll give you the hands-on information you need to stay compliant with ever-changing employment laws, the strategies you need to win the war for talent, and much more. So you can focus on what you do best, growing your business. Enjoy the show. Title VII Compliance for Employers, Practical Steps to Take. My name is Mike Vinoy, Vice President of Marketing at Assure, and my guest today, if you're a regular watcher of the show, you know Brian, Brian Schenker. He's an attorney at the Long Island, New York office of Jackson Lewis. Brian's practice focuses on representing employers in a wide range of workplace matters, as well as preventative advice and counseling. Brian has extensive experience defending class and collective action lawsuits under federal and state wage and hour laws. He has successfully defended wage and hour audits conducted by the U.S. and New York State Departments of Labor, and Brian regularly handles cases before courts and administrative agencies involving claims of discrimination, sexual harassment, and retaliation. Welcome to the show, Brian. Thanks for having me again, Mike. All right, so Title VII. I think everybody knows, um, if they don't remember the exact year, so 1964, the Civil Rights Act. I think people generally know the gist of, of the Civil Rights Act. Um, they might not know, they may have heard the term Title VII, but w- what specifically is Title VII? What, how does that overlap, relate to the Civil Rights Act of 1964? Right. So, you know, Title VII was basically a part of the act that uh, was more or less at the time a reminder to employers not to discriminate against employees under uh, who had certain, you know, protected uh, characteristics, and it also created the EEOC, the uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, to enforce the act, uh, the Title VII, rather. And then, you know, it was given much more teeth, you know, years later, a couple decades later, with amendments in 1991 that added damages, provisions, jury trials, uh, and that's really when I think that employers, uh, you know, took notice of, uh, of Title VII. Uh, but really, you know, a lot of the enforcement of it comes through the EEOC as well as private actions. And, you know, it's, uh, it's about discrimination. It's about uh, treating employees uh, similarly, regardless of, you know, for instance, you know, their race. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's the main focus. Uh, as I mentioned, there are damages available under Title VII. Uh, you know, that depends on employer size uh, in terms of the emotional distress and punitive damages, but you know, there's back pay and potential front pay damages if, for instance, an employee is terminated in a discriminatory manner. Uh, and so, you know, it is something that employers need to take notice of. And obviously, with a lot of these things, there are, uh, you know, state laws that apply, but these federal uh, requirements under Title Title Seven, you know, apply, um, you know, to employers all across the nation. So I want to go down that path in a bit, uh, talking about how states are adopting their own versions of, say, the the Civil Rights Act and, t- and elements of Title Seven. Um, but but hold off for a second. I am curious. Uh, and I, I don't necessarily I'm not looking to explore a, a whole history lesson here, but you say teeth were added, like starting in 1991. Um, so clearly, civil rights movement was huge in the 60s. Legislation passed. Um, so it became law. What, what, what happened prior to 1991? Was it, was it just more civil action for violations? Uh, you know, what, what, what was the lack of enforcement that happened way back when? Right. Well, you know, that was the thing. It was still on the books. There were, there were these requirements not to discriminate, uh, but there were damages provisions later added. So okay. uh, that, that was the real big difference. You know, the EEOC was created to enforce it. 
Uh, and you know, I believe there were you know potential remedies, uh, you know, such as you know injunctive relief. Uh, but you know the damages, and again, you know, when it comes to businesses, oftentimes it's you know money is a big motivator, and right. I think that was uh, one of the uh, you know reasons for the 1991 amendments to add those uh, damages, uh, so that you know there would be more reason to comply. Got it. In, in EEOC Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, right? right. Um, when did the, when did the EEOC come along? Did that come along in ninety one with with the with, with these the, the the teeth that came along to enforce? Title so title? so the EEOC was actually uh, created in the, in the same Civil Rights Act back in okay. nineteen sixty four. So they've been around. They've been the enforcement arm for you know Title seven, uh, and obviously as time has gone by, the EEOC's uh, you know, ability to enforce, you know, has increased, obviously, with, you know, damages, that's a, that's a big enforcement mechanism. Uh, also, you know, injunctive relief, such as, you know, reinstatement. Uh, and, you know, for instance, when there are discriminatory policies, you know, they can uh, also uh, seek other types of relief, whether it's, you know, training or implementing, you know, different policies. So, uh, the EOC is, is still very much involved, you know, when employees have a Title VII claim or are looking to assert one, uh, they need to go file with the EEOC first uh, before they can go to, you know, to court to assert their Title VII claims. And the EEOC either, uh, you know, does not investigate and issues a right to sue letter, giving the employee the opportunity to go out uh, on their own to court, or if it's a case that presents some, you know, issues that are uh, of interest to the EOC, the EOC can actually take up a case on its own and file in court and proceed on behalf of, uh, of employees. Um, and so, you know, the EOC, you know, they also focus a lot on uh, mediation and resolving cases. So if you've ever uh, received a uh, EEOC charge alleging you know, some Title VII uh, violation, uh, one of the first things the EEOC will do is look to see if you know, the employer is interested in resolving the matter. And they offer typically free of charge uh, mediation services uh, to resolve the claims, you know, understanding that it's typically in the employer's and employee's interest, you know, to resolve matters and, and not engage in, you know, uh, long and costly litigation. Got it. Um, so, so I think most are obvious. Most, everybody's heard of them, but just rattle off for me if you could. What were in '64? What were the protected classes? Which employees uh, were? Uh, uh, could, could you not discriminate against? And then maybe talk about how that is evolving, right? Um, there's certainly been an evolution around uh, sexuality, gender, it, 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 that's, you know, obviously a, a, a bit of a lightning rod politically to talk about, but certainly employers need to understand. So maybe start at the beginning. What right. were the protected groups defined? And then how has that evolved? And I think it didn't evolve much until, you know, rather recently? Yeah, uh, so great question. So, right, Title VII uh, prohibits discrimination or harassment uh, on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, and national origin. Uh, now, what you were pointing to is, uh, you know, sex discrimination. That definition has evolved over time uh, to include both pregnancy discrimination, as well as mo much more recently in the last 10 years or so, uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, so I'll, I'll get into that, uh, you know, in a moment, but, you know, there are some other, you know, federal statutes that are not Title VII, but they, you know, interact, we can say, with Title VII. For instance, you know, the EEOC enforces some other federal statutes that provide protections uh, to other category uh, characteristics, such as you know the Americans with Disabilities Act, right? right. That prohibits right. 
employers from discriminating on the basis of disability, and it adds a requirement to make reasonable accommodations for individuals who suffer from a disability. Uh, you also have the Age Discrimination in Employment Act, the ADEA, uh, similar to Title VII, prohibits discrimination, but on the basis of age uh, against people who are age 40 or over. Um, you know, there's the Equal Pay Act, which right. very similar to the, you know, sex or gender discrimination. Uh, it's technically part of the Fair Labor Standards Act, but it targets wage disparities between men and women, uh, right. requiring equal pay for equal work. Uh, right. But getting back to, to your question, you know, I, I think sexual orientation and gender identity is something where uh, in the last you know, 10 years, there's been a sea of change, right? So until roughly 10 years ago, it was pretty much settled that sexual orientation and gender identity claims were not within Title VII's reach, right? But this all changed with the uh, U.S. Supreme Court's decision in Bostock v. Uh, Clayton County, Georgia, uh, where the Supreme Court held that Title VII bars discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. So where the there yeah you know, where waters might have been muddied before it's been cleared up and just to be very clear you know discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity is not permitted um, yeah. and so right regardless of you know the politics of this it is something that employers should take note of because it's a requirement uh, right and so basically the courts. You know, the Supreme Court has said that gender identity and sexual orientation, they they deal with sex. So that's sex, you know, part of sex discrimination. Yeah. Um, and so, it, you know, it's very important to, for employers to understand these these terms. Right. So, you know, gender, I, when we talk about, you know, gender, right, that's Really, you know, the concept of gender really refers to, you know, someone's, you know, attitudes, feelings, behavior um, that may be associated in that culture with, you know, biological sex. Um, but, you know, gender identity, that's someone's, you know, inner sense of their own gender, right? Which may or may not match, you know, the sex they were assigned at birth. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, gender expression can be, you know, uh, expression of gender identity can be through a number of ways, right? Through, through dress, grooming, mannerisms, speech patterns, social interactions. Um, and, you know, it runs the gamut. It runs a range from masculine to feminine. Uh, and then certainly some transgender people, you know, express their gender consistent with how they feel, which, you know, may or may not be with, you know, in accordance with the sex they were, you know, signed at, assigned at birth. Um, yeah, and, and I just want to be crystal clear. We are painfully aware at how divisive this topic can be. The, this show is not about pros, cons, my beliefs, Brian's beliefs. This is about what the Supreme Court says is enforceable under Title VII. So as an employer, I think everybody gets, I mean, there's nobody with their, you know, there's, there's nobody with their, you know, head in the sand on race, religion, uh, 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 country of or, uh, origin. Uh, I mean, we, we get, we can't discriminate these things. And I think largely, probably most people uh, understand, you know, homosexuality. Okay, you know, that that is newly enforced and made clear by the Supreme Court. <clears throat> but people, I think, get it. There's obviously this whole hot button topic around transgenderism. Uh, and just to be crystal clear, I don't care where you stand on this topic. You, everybody has opinions. But the law says you can't discriminate based on it. So just crystal clear, not a political show. We're just simply explaining the law to small business owners and entrepreneurs because you can't choose to follow the law. Whether you love it and embrace it, and you think finally about time, or you think this totally violates my sense of whatever, uh, uh, this is the law. It, anything else without going down into, you know, 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Water right, and, and that's right. You know, this is these are things to know so that you don't violate the law. And really, the focus should be on an employee's ability to perform their job. And so, not just you know gender identity, but any characteristic, like you mentioned, right. race, age, uh, country of origin, all these things. Characteristics like those are irrelevant to job performance and should have no bearing on workplace interactions, right? Uh, so that's you know, a lot of what we're discussing today, regardless of what characteristic. We're, we're and Brian, doing. you and I have talked about it. Mary Simmons, also a regular guest on the show, she and I have had talked about this, I don't know, 50 times in the last year uh, on shows. For best practices for HR, it, it always kind of points back to, you know, employee handbook, job descriptions, competencies required to perform those jobs. And if you document these things and really focus on what are the competencies required to perform a job and you only post job openings that list those job descriptions and the skills and competencies required and you focus your interviewing process on that, your performance management process on that, it really kind of takes care of itself about helping you to stay away from any gray area when it comes to Title VII. But um, uh, nonetheless, especially in this emerging, emerging area around what the Supreme Court would call sex, which includes sexual orientation and gender identity, employers need to know. So, um, okay, l l let's let's come back a little bit. What's the, uh, there are, have there been a couple pieces of major legislation, I don't think anything recent necessarily, but it's, um, and I think you alluded to it, but I think like Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, they, they are, there are separate laws federally than Title VII, than the Civil Rights Act, but they build upon and reinforce. Do you, what do you think the trend is there federally? Do you think we should expect to see more uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, Equal Pay Act? I think you mentioned a third do you expect more at the federal level or do you think this is just going to increasingly expand at the state level? You know, I think it's something we're really going to see more expansion at the state level before we might see things uh, come federally. Uh, and I think you know, that, that's typically the trend. Right. Uh, but, you know, it, it's much harder to, you know, you know, our, a diverse country like ours, right, to get, you know, sufficient agreement, uh, you know, to pass, you know, certain protections on a federal level. Uh, so, you know, a lot of what we've seen over the last, you know, five, 10 years is state and local governments taking up, uh, you know, various you know, protections and laws. And look, a lot of them, to some extent, relate to protections, you know, on the books. Uh, at the federal level, right? For instance, recently we've seen a whole lot of uh, activity when it comes to, you know, the pay gap between men and women, as well as, you know, other, uh, you know, uh, classes of individuals. And, you know, states are taking up laws, whether it's, um, you know, transparency in, you know, job postings and salaries, or, you know, salary history bans, Right. You know, those are, again, tied closely to certain protections. So I think that eventually we, we might see these things uh, creep into federal law. But uh, I think for now, we'll see more and more states take these issues up. Uh, and then, you know, if there's widespread support you know, enough, that, then we might see the federal government, you know, add the thing, you know, add to the requirements. Right. There, you know, as I mentioned, equal pay, there's the Equal Pay Act. But compared to a lot of state and local laws, you know, it's um, a much tamer version of what we see out there right now. Um, yeah, I, I'm seeing it the same way. It's it's uh, it feels like, and and I don't know if this is simply. Um, I mean, obviously things changed directions at the national level from the 2008 election. Um, and then coming out of 2008 into, you know, a, a big, big events, big recession. Um, and then uh, really this dichotomy of styles and, and policies uh, at the presidential level from 2008 to 2012, to, excuse me, to 2016, enter uh, a, a pandemic. 
Um, I, I think, I think those big events have maybe temporarily tamped things down at the federal level. Uh, in but the states, it feels to me like they're just taking matters more into their own hands every single day, and so uh, I don't see that trend changing. And whether whether it's Title Seven examples or it's leave types, um, it's uh, their own expansion of um, FLSA, you know, overtime rules, minimum wage laws. Uh, this just seems it's not even states; it's counties, it's cities, municipalities within counties. The I, I don't see where this tips back towards being federal. I see this continuous fracturing of yeah. local versions of these laws. Is that is that yeah, how you see I, it? Yeah, I, I see it the same way. And I think, you know, look, for some employers, if you have a single work site, that doesn't become too complicated. You know what county, you know what city, you know what state you're in. Uh, but the way this has gone for employers that have you know, multiple sites within the same state, for instance, if you're in California, but you have you know, uh, uh, locations in different counties, you might have all sorts of laws, uh, apply, different laws applying to your company. So you know, it does, this patchwork of laws does create some compliance issues for uh, you know, employers with multiple work sites or yeah. you know, within a state or even without it, you know, outside of the state. Uh, so it's an added compliance element for employers for sure. Uh, but yeah, I think for the foreseeable future, it, it's probably what's going to continue. Yeah, and I, th I think, and we don't have to go to super deep and kind of come back to Title Seven, but I, I think for, for employers, one of the biggest challenges, um, it's, not, it's not just if you're a small business with multiple locations, because so many small businesses, you start out with one location, whether you maybe you end up with many. Um, but in a world where I certainly advocate to, you know, the the internet has flattened everything in the, the, the available workforce and your ability to find talent that is perfectly aligned to your product, to your mission, to your culture, uh, is it's the greatest opportunity for talent uh, uh, in, in our history. And so we should be seeking outside, you know, the traditional, you know, five mile radius of our brick and mortar building and finding talent wherever it sits. Mm -hmm. um, right. But in a world where legislation probably mandates where the work is performed, whether that's payroll taxes, sales taxes, <clears throat> um, leave types, minimum wage uh, uh, and certainly discrimination um, when the laws are different in the different locations and it's not just the states, it's cities and counties, this just gets more and more complex for I'd say those more progressive employers who are tapping into the talent pool that by definition is geographically dispersed. Yeah, I think you make an excellent point there, right? Even one location, but you're hiring employees from other places, depending on the law, you might have different laws applying to them. It's, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So I, I guess our guidance to employers would be, man, tap into that global, at least tap into the national, if not global uh, labor pool, uh, but do so eyes wide open that um, compliance it's not just where your headquarter, your quote unquote headquarters is or your main office or whatever, however you think about your business. Um, many, if not most of HR oriented laws uh, are driven by where the work is actually performed in a work from home employee. That means where they live, not where your business is. All right, let's let's come back to to Title seven. Um, Brent, let's maybe ex explore. So, so what would be so I think everybody gets uh, the major categories you can't discriminate on. It makes sense that uh, we've continued to pass federal versions that I think kind of put some tighter rails around those protected groups where, you know, it's expanding uh, to states and municipalities. Um, where do people get in trouble the most? Because for the most part, entrepreneurs are just hardworking folks trying to build a business. They're not trying to discriminate. Um, and so whether they've done anything wrong or didn't do anything wrong, people still get in trouble every day 
uh, in in all these categories of Title Seven? What what are the biggies that we can explore so people can can you know see around corners in this area? Right. So yeah, there are a few different types of claims we we commonly see under. Uh, Title Seven, and again, these are going to be the same type of claims, more or less, that you'd see under you know the the state or local versions of uh, of anti discrimination laws. Uh, the first one, and qu- quite a common one, is a disparate treatment case claim, right? So disparate treatment, uh, as it sounds, right, involves allegations that the employer discriminated against uh, an individual of a certain protected group, right? Because of their race, color, sex, religion, or national origin, uh, and that essentially what they're, the employee is saying, I was treated less well than others who are similarly situated outside of my protected group. Uh, and the reason for the treatment is because of, you know, for instance, my race or my sex or my religion. Uh, and so... You know, this type of claim requires someone to allege, of course, that they're within one of these protected categories, that they were you know, qualified for the job or in the case of an applicant, they applied for the position, uh, and then that they were subject to an adverse employment action. Uh, and the last one being that there's some inference of discrimination, right, that they were treated differently than others uh, or that, you know, others were treated more favorably, something that indicates they were, you know, that uh, a protected category uh, played a role in the decision. Uh, And so again, when we're dealing with disparate treatment, we're only dealing with, you know, material adverse changes in employment, right? So, uh, you know, one of the things we see here, and I've litigated, you know, many cases involving this, that you know, someone might complain, you know, they were left off of certain emails or, you know, not included in meetings, um, you know, so, you know some, some things that might cause someone to be upset and might very well be because of a protected category. Uh, but those types of things, right, being left out of meetings, not being included on emails, uh, you know, are considered minor things that don't raise to the level of an adverse uh, employment change. So for the purposes of disparate treatment, right, we're talking about, you know, termination uh, from employment, you know, uh, you know, discipline, perhaps, maybe a suspension, uh, a change in benefits or compensation, right, a, a decrease in, in salary, you know, a, a substantial change in, uh, you know, in workload or, or job duties, or, you know, in the case of an applicant, you know, not hiring. Individual. Yeah. Uh, so again, you know, it Title Seven doesn't regulate, you know, all discrimination necessarily, especially in a disparate treatment. When you're saying, you know, someone's claiming to be treated unfairly, it, it has to do with, you know, a material term of employment. Uh, and then, really, can we, can we go down that path for just a second? Mary and I have talked on the show on this topic before um, about bias, right? In like. Maybe perhaps one of the, the most common areas of bias is height or beauty or weight. Does Title VII, you know, protect, you know, people who are short, overweight, not attractive? I mean, because <laughs> there's so, clearly bias that happens in the workplace. There, absolutely. But, it, but so, are they protected under Title VII? Yeah, so you, you make a great point. And so my response would be, the, the, the lawyer the lawyerly answer that that one might expect it, it depends right but let me explain so <laughs> you, you know, lawyers <laughs> <laughs> so you know those height for instance you know that's not a protected category uh, but it, it almost it brings me right into my next topic of, of the next type of claim a disparate impact claim so you could uh, see a situation where an employer might have a facially neutral policy of you need to be you know this tall, six feet tall for this position. Uh, or, you know, and, and let's just pretend that has nothing to do with the actual, you know, requirements yeah. of the job, just an arbitrary decision, you have to be six feet. So that is going to have a negative impact, a disparate impact on women, right? Who 
are generally shorter than men. So that would, you know, a policy that, you know, requires people to be six feet for a certain position, assuming there is no business necessity, uh, yeah, got it. That, that, that could then implicate, you know, sex discrimination. So, okay. you know, I, I guess it's great. It, it, you know, let me then explain what a disparate impact claim, because uh, this is a claim that people don't necessarily think of uh, when they think of discrimination, right? People tend to understand disparate treatment better. It's saying, you know, if employee A is of a you know, protected category and employee B is not, I'm treating them equally, right? Uh, disparate impact goes beyond that in that it doesn't require the employer to intentionally discriminate against anyone. Right. Uh, a disparate impact claim basically alleges that a neutral policy has a negative impact on a protected class. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we often see that there's a lot of litigation regarding, you know, aptitude tests, right? Some, you know, federal agencies and some employers will have applicants take, you know, a certain test to measure, uh, you know, their, their skill or, or whatnot for a position. And the statistics, of, you know, of the results of some of those tests show that, you know, for instance, you know, that people of a certain race will score substantially lower than, you know, others that say Caucasians who are, you know, uh, not in a protected category. So, you know, even a neutral policy or practice can, you know, create liability for an employer. Uh, now, there, there are ways to defend against those, as I mentioned before, that, you know, an employer can show that the practice or policy is job related and consistent with their business necessity. Right. So um, you could imagine a situation where there, there could be a height requirement if there if it had to do specifically with the job being performed. And there is no better way to weed out applicants you know, who could not perform the job. Uh, but, you know, that's it's a it's a great question, because just because you're not considering a protected category doesn't mean that, you know, a practice doesn't actually discriminate. against. <clears throat> and I want to be cl so just so everybody understands we're talking two separate things. Disparate treatment is one type of a claim. Disparate impact is another. The, the disparate treatment is more self-evident. Right. It's like, oh, you didn't hire me because this. I was punished because of that. And so I'm treated differently. This is, I think, I think the area of disparate impact, this, this one, you might be completely blind to it. This, this probably leans more towards the bias oriented conversations. Yeah. Um, but it is still illegal to discriminate if the impact of your otherwise non-discriminatory policies or maybe not policies, but just behaviors result in therefore the impact is disparate. So tell me if this is a good example, Brian, if I, I went to uh, XYZ university um, and I was in such and such fraternity. And so I've had a lot of success hiring people from there because, you know, they're good, good folks, just like me. And coincidentally, my workforce looks pretty white and uh, male because that's the profile. Now, I didn't have a policy that said I'm going to hire white men. But if my primary recruiting platform is a fraternity at a specific university, I mean, the policy could lead to uh, a disparate impact unintentionally. Am I saying that right? Right, right. One could say that that's, you know, become a practice of the company to hire solely out of this fraternity, which then excludes women. And, you know, it's funny going back to your, uh, I think your height or, or weight, uh, you know, example before that there actually was a Supreme Court decision uh, where I believe it was a prison guard, uh, a prison, you know, they, they used a test for uh, applicants that, you know, required them to meet certain height and weight requirements and that the, the prison company, they said, well, this, this relates, this correlates to strength and prison guards need to be strong. That's a business necessity. And what the Supreme Court found was that height and weight don't relate to strength. 
right? And that there's a different test that could have actually measured strength directly that wouldn't have the the, the unintended result of yeah. uh, you know excluding women who who might be shorter. That's a great so, example. So yeah, so you know, I think that's why when you know, and, and look, these can be you know all sorts of, of policies, and you know, I think you know one thing to remember is that Title Seven doesn't just uh, apply to your existing employees; it can apply to applicants. And so I, I think, Mike, your example was great. You know, in, in you know the recruiting or applicant stage uh, of the employment cycle, because that's often where we see some types of uh, disparate impact claims. Uh, and, you know, again, depending on, you know, what the company's requirements are, again, which may not have any racial component or any sex component to it, but that the, you know, the application of this policy or practice, you know, results on, in excluding people overwhelmingly from some protected category. Yeah. All right. So disparate treatment, we cover that in a while and how that is sounds the same, but it's really quite different from disparate impact. Um, taking notes before here for, for topics, harassment, right? Harassment. So yeah. what, 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 what is, what is, what is, what is commonly entailed into a claim of harassment? Right. So the typical harassment claim is a hostile work environment claim. And that's under title seven, right? That's unwelcome conduct that, basically has the effect of interfering with an individual's performance or creates an intimidating, hostile or offensive, you know, work environment. Uh, now, let's remember that unwelcome conduct needs to be related to one of the protected categories under Title VII, because again, you know, courts are very clear, not all harassment is unlawful. Right. To this law you know, only applies to race, color, sex, uh, religion, uh, national origin, and obviously some of the other federal laws, right? Age, disability, um, you know, and such. But if, you know, it's not a uh, workplace civility code, right? You know, yeah. no one's saying an employer has to be nice. No one's saying they, you know, that unwelcome, you know, that inappropriate conduct, you know, based on unprotected categories is unlawful. It might be unwise, uh, but really we're talking about uh, prohibiting harassment uh, on that relates to the protected categories. And under Title VII, that, that conduct, that harassment needs to be so severe and pervasive that it alters the conditions of employment. Right. So in reality, what, what does that mean? Yeah. That generally courts will look at situations where an employee might have been subject to a few uh, one or maybe even a few questionable incidents that don't doesn't amount to unlawful harassment. Um, you know, making one inappropriate joke you know, in the workplace generally isn't going to rise to the level of hostile work environment. Now, depending on how severe that is, right, you know, one, for instance, racial epithet, you know, that could, that could, you know, lead to a hostile work environment, right? So if a very, you know, severe incident occurs and it's just one time, that could create a hostile work environment. But the main intention here is that, you know, this is something that occurs over time, that this person gets, you know, it's more than petty slights. It's, you know, comments, uh, you know, what, what might it include? It could be, you know, uh, inappropriate jokes, unwelcome touching, you know, epithets, slurs, um, you know, stereotyping, uh, demeaning comments. And again, those could even be on social media or email. It doesn't need to be in person. Um, you know, inappropriate right. comments about someone's dress, right? Or, you know, how they look or sharing someone's, you know, look, I, I've had a lot of cases where there were employees who kind of probably thought they were just, you know, having water cooler talk and might talk about their sexual exploits. Right. And that's, a, you know, some employees found that incredibly offensive and maybe asked for it to stop, but people thought it was funny and continued and that can create a hostile work environment. For instance, you know, based on sex. 
Brian, I, I mean, I tend to give business owners benefit of the doubt for intentions, right? I mean, I don't think there's a bunch of people out here. Um, obviously, discrimination in uh, based on sex, racism, these things are real. They exist. But, but, uh, but I tend to believe it's the minority, not, not the majority. Where, where do, and so when it is blatant, somebody using a racial epitaph, somebody uh, can, you know, being too handsy, and I think anything that handsy is probably too handsy, but, but being handsy at work, I mean, these, these are pretty clear lines I think everybody gets. Where are the areas that you see employers get in trouble and they're surprised, you know? Uh, uh, she's a great manager. She's just a good person. Everybody knows it. And she's like, what do you mean I'm harassment? I had no idea. I mean, I, I think this is probably where we need to guide yeah. folks the most. No, and I, I, you're, you're spot on. So I think that, and again, we'll talk later about, you know, what employers can do, but, I, you know, training comes into play here because, look, you know, even if someone does not object to some type of, you know, communication or jokes, things like that. What's appropriate for the workplace it doesn't change based on, you know, whether someone seems to object to it or not, right? You know, so I, I think that's often what I see in, in my cases where, you know, the employer will typically say, yeah, but, you know, the, the manager says the employee engaged in these conversations and, you know, everyone joked about this stuff and they, they never complained about it. It just seemed like it was, you know, just regular kind of, you know, guy talk or gal talk, you know, things like that. But again, you know, that doesn't make it appropriate for the workplace. So I think, yeah. you know, that what supervisors, what employers need to understand and train their supervisors on is what's appropriate for the workplace, right? You know, so there are some things that should just not be discussed, right? Jokes that are insensitive or, you know, based on race or sex, that might be fine, you know, between two friends out of the workplace, but that's not necessarily workplace conduct because someone overhearing that or part of that conversation may be, you know, deeply offended by that. And, you know, so I, I think that, you know, having managers who can identify this type of conduct is great. But then, you know, also having an open door policy where employees understand that they can go to the employer uh, before these things escalate to an issue where, you know, they feel that they're going to have to go to an attorney or the EEOC. Right. right. Like, you know, so employers who can show that they care and they will consider your complaint and take it seriously, you're much more likely to have employees coming to you. And again, as we'll discuss later, it's much more beneficial to have employees bring these issues to the employer than going elsewhere, which likely leads to a claim. Right. So if employees believe the, the company will address their concerns, then a lot of times, you know, a hostile work environment type claim won't have time to develop because the first or second time someone hears something inappropriate, they'll, they might say something. They might bring it to HR or their supervisor and say, hey, I'm not comfortable with this. And then the employer can you know, have an opportunity you know, to address the issue. And again, that can also form a defense to, to this type of claim, right? Having the right policies in place, taking action when there is a complaint, you know, that can form a defense to a hostile work environment claim. Under title. I know we're going to talk some best practices to, to wrap the conversation up in a few minutes, but um, I, it's something that I, I've seen in, in a lot of small businesses, especially, right? You don't have an HR department. Um, you, you have the owner. You have maybe, a, you know, an office manager who wears many, many hats um, where I think, I think there's this ex when you have a mix, so let's say you're a small business, you've got 25 employees and you've got your good business, you've got very low turnover, which means, you know, 20 of those employees have been around for a while. 10 of them have been here for a really long time. And there's not many new people that come into the mix when there's almost this, almost this orientation of new people, not to the job, but to the culture where I think some people perhaps get used to, oh, she just tells those types of jokes 
but it's but it's not how she really thinks. Or he seems really mean and gruff, but he's just that. That's just how he is. And I think people learn the humans in these behaviors. And I think it's almost like the the metaphor of the frog in the pot of boiling water. I think as an entre- uh, entrepreneur or business owner, <clears throat> you could be in a lot hotter water than you think you are. Bringing new faces into into these areas uh, that somebody from the outside they might see this as harassment. Where to you internally, it's like we're just family. You, you mentioned, you, and it, what got me thinking this was you said what might be appropriate for two friends talking at the bar versus at work. Well, if you've been working with somebody for 5, 10, 20 years, you're probably friends, right? Yeah. And so th- these lines can blur. And anything you would you would guide before we get an explicit best practices around <clears throat> this whole long-term employment, new employees coming in, friend zone kind of thing? Yeah. So, yeah, it's so funny because I've seen this before in litigation and mm-hmm. I've seen it play out and yeah, the result isn't good for the employer because, you know, I, and I, I guess what I would say is that setting the culture for your company is very important. And it's if, if, if you as the employer, the owner, HR, don't actively work on setting the right culture, then the culture that's created is just whatever the employees create. And more often than not, that's not going to necessarily be a fully compliant culture. Right. So I, I think the the main takeaway is that doing nothing can run you risks. And that, you know, what we'll discuss, a, a culture of compliance, a culture of open door, you know, receptive, taking, you know, to complaints and taking them seriously. You know, that's the type of thing that sets the tone and then, when you have new employees, right? They're, they're not gonna be walking into the quote unquote wild west, right? That's been created by, you know, years of neglecting, you know, what your company's culture should be. Um, because just because you've let it get that way, it doesn't mean that's how it should be. It doesn't mean it's compliant. Uh, and it could be someone who's endured that culture for 10 years, who's the one who complains, right? It doesn't take necessarily a new person, but right, you know, the the, the excuses that, oh, that's just how Johnny is, or yeah, he's just a really nice guy. He's a little touchy feely. That's just how he is. You know, right. It, right. that's not the defense that you, you want to be asserting when, when you're facing a claim like one of these. Let's move on to, we've got a couple more here. I, I, this is this is the one that I think in my own personal life, seeing this play out for entrepreneurs has been the biggest surprise uh, is retaliation. Because retaliation claims, um, certainly, it could be, you know, the employer is is not taking a very high road and it's clear retaliation. Oh, you're going to do that? Well, watch this. That's usually not what drives these. These are much more subtle and nuanced where frequently I've, I've seen cases where the employer genuinely had that employee's best interest in mind. They made a change policy procedure, sales territory, commission plans, whatever, to that they thought they were literally helping this employee. The employee perceived it as, oh, I complained and they retaliated against me. Good, good. good. Yeah. Un- unpack this area of retaliation. Yeah, and I think you've set the stage very well. And to me, retaliation claims are almost the, they probably are the biggest concern that employees ha- employers have in this area. Uh, I believe under the EEOC statistics for uh, the past year, whether it was 2021 or 2022, it was over over 50 percent of the charges they received had uh, retaliation claims under a federal statute. Whereas uh, I think, you know, and you're in the low 30 percent for race and sex and the low 20 percent for charges that included, I think, an age discrimination claim. So they are by far and away the, the, the number one claim the EEOC uh, receives. And a lot of it is because a retaliation claim doesn't require an individual to prove a discrimination claim. All that an employee needs to prove uh, for a retaliation claim is that they participated 
in protected activity, which means they opposed or assisted someone else in opposing discrimination, yeah. uh, and that they suffered an adverse employment action that was uh, the cause, and the cause of that was their protected you know, uh, activities. So just unpacking that, protected activity, that'll generally be a complaint. It can be an informal complaint. It could be a comment to the manager. It could be a written complaint to HR. It could be filing an EEOC charge. All of those are protected activity. It could be test, you know, supporting someone, testifying for someone who's filed an EEOC charge. Um, and then they suffer an adverse employment action. Now, earlier when we were talking about disparate treatment, I, I mentioned how you know, for, for that type of claim, an, an adverse employment action had to be something big, right? Like a, a termination, a suspension, uh, you know, failure to hire. And it didn't necessarily involve more minor things like being left out of meetings or off of emails. When it comes to retaliation, even those more minor things can be actionable. And I think that's what you're, you might have made a point towards, Mike, where, you know, there can be a lot of subtlety uh, you know, in retaliation, right? You know, you don't just need to fire someone, right? It could be assigning them additional duties or taking away duties or, you know, not inviting them to a department meeting, uh, leaving them off, you know, uh, department emails, uh, you know. Ch changing their work shift. They yeah. came to you with a concern about employee X and that employee X is maybe did something not so nice, but you're like, you know what, they've been here, they, they have more tenure. Um, I'm just going to split those two up. Yeah. Well, you think you did a good thing. It's like, well, I complained about somebody who was harassing me and they put me on a shift that impacts my family and my my my, my, my life schedule, right? Yeah. And, and look, I think for companies, the biggest thing to understand is that, especially in my experience, the retaliation you know, that occurs does typically does not come from the top, right? There's usually not a directive from the business owner or HR to, you know, change this term or condition of employment. Yeah. A lot of times this is, you know, manager or supervisor driven, right? Where if someone's made a complaint and they're still reporting to a supervisor, that supervisor finds out if you haven't made it explicitly clear to that supervisor that they're not to retaliate, it may be their just, you know, internal, you know, feeling that I've got, I'm going to get back at this person and I'm going to find a way and it's not going to be so explicit, but, you know, they're going to do little things like ignoring the employee or, you know, what have you. And so, it's often the supervisors that are, you know, engaging in this, not necessarily, you know, coming from, you know, the, the higher management levels. And so when, when a company does receive a complaint of discrimination, it's very important to notify verbally and in writing to, yeah. you know, the managers, the supervisors who deal with that employee that they should not retaliate against that individual. Right. Now, I should also point out that just because someone engages in protected activity, right, making an internal complaint, that doesn't mean that there are no repercussions for poor performance. It only means that, you know, it uh, really amplifies the need to document uh, discipline and document the reasons why a company takes certain actions so that, you know, understanding there's a chance someone might allege retaliation. Let's make sure we have the documentation to show why we're doing this. So, you know, I, I would never tell an employer just because someone's filed a complaint or made some internal uh, comments about discrimination that you can't change their terms and conditions of employment, but we wanna make sure that we're doing it for business related reasons and it has nothing to do uh, you know, with with the protected activity. Right, that's a good segue. Let, let, let's wrap the conversation on, on best practices. So kind of explored a bunch of the reasons, disparate treatment, disparate impact, harassment, retaliation. Uh, we didn't talk straight up negligence, but I think people understand what that means. Um, what are the proactive things that employers should be doing to stay compliant with Title VII? 
for right. So I mean, the the first, the very first starting point here is going to be have an anti discrimination policy. Uh, you know, if you ever you know have you know an EEOC charge or face a lawsuit, one of the first requests is what what are the policies in place? So you want a very clear anti discrimination policy that will forbid all forms of discrimination. Right, you're going to address those under Title VII, the other federal statutes we've mentioned. If there are any additional, you know, uh, protected categories under state or local law, you'll want to include those, and you know, define discrimination. Right, you know, it can, includes harassment, or, you know, based on any protected characteristic. Uh, it, you know, a good policy might even, you know, include examples of when discrimination, you know, can occur, for instance, you know, in recruitment, hiring, you know, interviews and, you know, promotions and transfers, compensation so that employees understand, you know, where it's prohibited. Uh, as we just mentioned, retaliation, retaliation should be explicitly uh, prohibited in this policy. But probably the most important part of an anti-discrimination policy is the section about how to report and complain about discrimination. Uh, number one, there should be multiple people to complain to. Uh, the, I, I often have situations where there's the problem is that it says there's one person to complain to in the company. And if, for instance, that is the person who's harassing the employee, they're not going to complain. And right. that would likely be excused under Title VII because why would they complain to their harasser that they're being harassed? They wouldn't expect right. anything to be done. So as, you know, as is commonly the case in a small business, yeah. even if it's not that person, they know that the harasser has been working for 10 years across the desk from the, the person that they would, the HR person, office manager, owner, so they don't feel safe reporting just because of that connection. Right, exactly. So that's why you want to make sure there are multiple ways to complain. Because as I mentioned, if, if the company doesn't provide an outlet to employees, then they're going to go externally. And it's the absolute ideal situation for an employer to handle discrimination matters internally. Why is that? Number one, obviously it reduces the likelihood of potential litigation, but number two, you're yeah. setting the culture of, we take complaints seriously, we're gonna deal with it. And you know that makes for a better workplace, better morale, and you know, less likely to you know, receive claims uh, you know, outside of the company. So you know, that's very important. Uh, and then, of course, it's not good enough to just have the policy, right? Many employers have a policy in place yeah. and they send me a handbook and I say, OK, did this employee receive it? Well, we think they did, but we're not sure. And so it's very important to have acknowledgments for the receipt of, you know, handbooks and anti-discrimination policies because, you and know, I'd say, and I'd say on that category, it's like a good CYA to like acknowledge receipt um, but do, do better. It, train on it. Walk, carve out time, mm -hmm. uh, on the clock time, page by page. Go through it. Explain this is what this means. This why this is why we put it in the employee handbook. Right? It's too important to not train on it. Yeah, and, and training is real important. And I think you know we often do separate training for employees and then, and management. Right. Because employees should understand you know, the law, but there's additional skills to teach management, such as, you know, the ones who are involved in hiring and firing and how, you know, what their requirements are and, you know, what can they say and what can't they say during an interview? And, you know, so I, I think how to spot, you know, discrimination or, you know, uh, or how to spot a request for an accommodation, how to spot an, a complaint. So, yes. You know, having a policy and having people sign for it alone, that's that's not enough. Right. There should be uh, some element of training, uh, you know, which which can go a long way. And then I, I think the last aspect, you know, of, of what an employer can do, and it's something we've you know, we've touched on, is addressing 
complaints of discrimination. So what, what are we really talking about? Investigations. And they are so important because not only right does it encourage this open workplace where people are comfortable raising issues, yeah. but it can provide the company a defense, an effective defense in litigation. Uh, and so, you know, just a few quick tips on on investigations of, of complaints. They should take place promptly. And so, you know, we're talking within 24 hours, the wheel should be in motion from either knowledge of the incident or the complaint, and they should be completed as soon as reasonably possible. It should be a priority. Uh, if you're a small employer and you're not equipped to do an investigation, look to an outside source, right? I know Assure has uh, HR consultants who, you know, can conduct investigations and sometimes a third party, you know, independent investigation is beneficial, even if you have the ability to do it yourself. Uh, but then, you know, documenting the investigation, right? Effective note taking for statements, um, you know, noting, you know, the date and time and location of interviews and, you know, including all the specific facts of, you know, what, what a person says, you know, these are the things we want to document. Um, and so, you know, I usually say that there are a number of steps, right? You, you develop a plan before you jump into the investigation, develop a plan. Who are we going to interview? What are the facts? What are the company policies at issue? Then you conduct the interview. Right. And you get documentation. Sometimes it might be text messages, could be emails, could be anything else. And then you're going to evaluate the evidence. Right. You know, you're the employer. You're coming to a decision as to what you reasonably think occurred based on uh, the evidence, the, the statements and the evidence. And then you decide you decide your course of action, whether we're going to implement some discipline, whether there was you know, no corroboration of the allegations. And you're going to document the reason for the decision. Uh, and then, look, you know, many employers will leave it there. They'll close the investigation. But I think you know, a key element to a good investigation is the follow up. Right. So let's say we found that, you know, uh, an individual was you know, possibly being harassed. Right. And we've you know, moved the supervisor somewhere else. And so we might want to check up every couple of weeks thereafter to make sure the employee isn't having issues or, you know, whatever it may be. Or even if the company found there was no corroboration to their allegations, maybe a couple of weeks later, you check in, make sure things are going well. You know, if it involves an accommodation, right, for, you know, religion or a disability, you know, we want to make sure. Uh, is the accommodation working? Things like that. So. Uh, you know, an investigation doesn't end right when you make the decision. I, I think a key element to a good investigation involves some follow up by the employer uh, to make sure that the outcome is working. Yeah, you know what? So I, I think well said two buckets, right? It's it's do say, you know, say we're going to do do what you said you were going to do. Right. It's it's you're silly not to have a policy. I mean, you really are in today's world. Hopefully, hopefully this hour has has helped underpin that. Um, but it's not enough to have this on paper. You actually have to w walk your talk, right? And then when th something does happen, you provide the the place and the forum in a in a in a, if, uh, a way for employees to make their complaints, air their grievances, share their concerns. Um, and I think if you do that. If you say what you're going to do and then do what you said you were going to do, you contribute to, to me, the single best practice uh, of all is always respect. Are you treating your employees with respect? Are you treating them the way you would want to be treated? Do you have a, a culture of open, honest, sometimes difficult conversations uh, where, where you can, you can move forward? Because if you do that, employees will give a lot of grace. I mean, they don't not file claims because they're lazy. They sometimes don't file claims even when there is clear harassment or retaliation or uh, adverse uh, impact or treatment. They don't do it because they're like, okay, he was stupid and he shouldn't have said or done that, but you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give him grace because of how he treats people and treats me. And I'll just assume that I'll, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt here. 
When you don't treat people well and aren't respectful to people, that's when you don't get the benefit of the doubt. Brian, anything you'd want to say in closing? No, I, I think you're right. And look, a, a lot of this is compliance. A lot of it also just goes goes to the workplace culture. And, you know, the compliance goes to that culture that, that you're just speaking of, right? If if an employer, if an employee sees the company doing the right things and they have a bad situation with a coworker or a supervisor, right, they're going to be less likely to just go assert a claim against the company in court. They're going to feel that, look, my company respects me. I can bring this to management. I can bring this to HR and they're going to take it seriously. And look, what a lot of civil rights laws really address and Title VII really addresses is respect, right? That employees should be respected. And what's the number one way to respect someone? Treating them the same as everyone else and not treating them differently because of some ca- you know, characteristic. And so you know, yeah. that's what this is about. And you know, even putting aside protected characteristics, just treating people fairly and respectfully in general uh, is the workplace, you know, culture that, that you want to create. And it's going to lead to less claims, uh, and might, might, you know, it might lead to more internal claims, but that's great. You can address those issues. Yeah. It'll lead, hopefully lead to less, uh, legal claims. Right. That's right. Brian, thanks for joining me today. Uh, I think, I think this is helpful. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of stuff that uh, when it comes to discrimination that I think we all just kind of take for granted. It's like, oh, that's not me. That doesn't apply to me. I'm a good person. I don't discriminate. Um, But employers get themselves in trouble uh, uh, with very innocent intentions. So good advice to to, to entrepreneurs, small business owners and managers to to be forward thinking when it comes to staying compliant, being compliant with, with Title VII. So thanks to you and thanks to everybody else for joining us today. Until next week, have a great week. At Assure, we build human capital management software and services that help 90,000 companies like yours attract, develop, and retain great people. Our low upfront costs and affordable subscription model allow you to save cash to invest in things that drive growth, not overhead. To learn more about how Assure can help you claim up to $26,000 per employee with the Employee Retention Tax Credit, automate your payroll, and build productive teams that are compliant with ever-changing HR laws. Visit AssureSoftware.com.